But tonight, I'm going to preach on the topic of teaching your children the truth. Teach your children the truth. And it's uh, sort of related to the celebrations that are happening now with Christmas, uh, especially with Christmas. You know, we need to make sure that we teach our children the cr truth. I mean, I don't want any uh, Christian growing up thinking that the 25th of December is the actual day that Jesus was born. But some Christians still think that. Some Christians think the reason why we celebrate Christmas on the 25th of December is because that's the day that Jesus was born. Now, there is some evidence, and, and nobody really knows the day that he was born, but I have heard people say things like, well, you know, Christmas time, you know, the 25th of December in the Northern Hemisphere is, is winter, and the shepherds wouldn't have been watching over their flock by night. So it, it could have possibly been the, the other time of the year, the warmer part of the year as opposed to December. And, you know, I'm not an expert on all the history behind where it is, but from what I've read, uh, you know, it was, it was a pagan festival on the 25th of December where people would, you know, worship the sun god. And then when Roman Catholicism basically became the state religion uh, uh, it, it, that in, in, uh, um, in the Roman Empire, that's when they sort of Christianized all these holidays and this is why they instead of celebrating the sun god on the 25th of december they started celebrating the birth of jesus christ because we really have no uh, uh direction in the bible uh, of of remembering jesus's birth and i'm not saying that there's anything wrong with that i don't have a problem with people remembering the birth of jesus christ at christmas it's just that if we do it let's do it in in spirit and in truth you know if we are going to have a Christian-centered holiday, let's make it about Jesus Christ rather than about other things, you know, about just the gifts, about Santa Claus and his elves. You know, if we're going to teach our children about Christmas and we're going to teach our children about the birth of Jesus Christ, let's teach them the truth. And this is what this sermon is about as well as other things. So that's what we're going to be talking about. Teach your children the truth. Don't censor the truth from your children. You know, teach them the whole counsel of God. Now, do you sometimes have to explain it in a way to help them understand more easily? Yes, but there should never be anything that is taught in the Bible that is not suitable for a children. If you have this mentality that hey, the Bible, there are things in the Bible that are not suitable for children's ears. You've got it wrong, right? Because God wants us to teach our children the whole counsel of God. So not only do we want to teach our children the truth, we don't want to lie to our children. You know, don't tell them lie. Don't, don't deceive them. I mean, I have met teenagers with trust issues. Why? Because their parents lied to them about Santa Claus, lied to them about the Easter Bunny, lied to them about the Tooth Fairy, lied to them about ghosts, and lied to them, you know, to, 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 you know, because they thought it was funny. Well, it wasn't so funny when you tried to tell them about Jesus Christ, and they think that's a myth as well. This is why it's important that children grow up expecting to hear truth from their parents, right? Expecting to hear truth. Now, what is truth? If we're going to teach our children the truth, where do we get truth from? We get it from the Word of God. Jesus said in John 17, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy Word is truth. Now, a lot of people have different ways to determine truth. Have you ever heard somebody say, Oh, well, you know, what's true to me? You know, I believe it's true. You know, they just think, Oh, I just determine my own truth. You know, they say, well, somebody, some expert told me. That's why they believe it. What about this one? I saw it on TV. I saw it on TV and that's why they believe it. I've heard that so many times. But the Bible tells us, no, the truth is the word of God. This is why Jesus can say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Because he's the word manifest in the flesh. You know, in, in, in 1 John it says, and our hands have handled of the word of life. The word which was with God, which was God, was manifest in the flesh. That's why Jesus can say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And in John 17, he says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And children ought to expect to hear truth from their parents. Deuteronomy 6, this is all the way back in the Old Testament, one of the books of Moses, where we get 
the, the command to love the Lord with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God. So you see how it starts with you adults, it starts with you parents. If you want to teach your children truth, it's got to start with you. You have got to love truth, you've got to love God, you've got to love God's word. You have got to have God's truth in order to teach it. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day, look at this, shall be in thine heart. So you see how the word of God has to be in your heart before you take the next step. You see how you have to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Have God's word in your heart. And then it says in verse 7, Thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. See, it doesn't just say you just teach your children lackadaisically. It's not just going to rub off on them by osmosis. You know, yeah, yeah, they're just going to see your... No, you've got to teach them diligently. It has to be purposeful. Ever seen that, that tag on Facebook? You know, parenting on purpose. You actually make a purpose of having an example, speaking to them about the things of God. You take it on yourself to teach your children the truth, teach your children the word of God, and you do it with diligence. And shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Now, when you read this passage, does it look like the way we're meant to teach our children is just we have just a set time in the week where we teach them the Bible? You know, we have like, you know, I'm not against family devotions, but, you know, is that how you do it? Where it's like, okay, everyone, everyone stop, stop your worldliness. Just sit away, you know, and we're going to stop and then we're going to learn the Bible. And then once we finish learning the Bible, we just go back to our ways. No. You read this and you see this is your daily example. You know, this is, this is one reason why, and I know this passage is not directly teaching homeschooling, but this is why I, I am for homeschooling. Right? Because homeschooling means your children are always with either you or your, or your wife. And you can do this. Look, at, does it look like it's only part of the day you're with your children? No, it's when you sit. It's when you're walking by the way. It's when you lie down, right? When you go to sleep, when you rise up. So your children are always there with you so you can teach them all the time diligently the ways of God and the truth. So this is why it's so important that you know the truth and you are with your children. You spend time with your children so that when they ask questions, you can give them the right answers and give them a biblical perspective. But that you've got to be around them. You've got to know what you're teaching in order to teach them diligently. So parents, you have to know the truth to teach the truth. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and thou sh they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. You see how it's, God is saying he wants the word of God to be the central focus of your life. Why? Because thy word is truth. Jesus is the word. The word was with God. The word is God. This is why it's so important. If you love God, you want a relationship with God, you want to have an you know, intimate knowledge of God. You need to have an intimate relationship and knowledge with His Word. You can't say, I love God, but then I don't really care what His Word says. Well, then you don't love God because God is the Word. Do you see what I'm saying? So He wants it to be a central for you. And thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. And this is where we get the practice of putting scriptures around the place. You know, that's why when you go into a Christian home, you know, there's usually scriptures on the wall, there's scriptures around because... This comes from this principle in the Old Testament that the Word of God is a central part of our life and it should be always with you and in front of your eyes so you don't forget it. We, we are forgetful people. We easily forget things. And look at what it says in Proverbs. You see how in Proverbs, we'll read a couple here. Proverbs 1, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Look at this. My son, hear the instruction of thy father and forsake not the law of thy mother. So you see how a proverb is that children ought to go to their parents and listen to their parents, listen to the wisdom that their parents impart. So you see how there's an expectation of parents to have this knowledge, to be a source of truth, not they come to you with a question about Christianity and it's like, 
oh, you, go ask Victor, or go ask your Sunday school teacher, or go ask this, go, because you don't know the answer. Hey, I'm not saying everybody knows everything. But I'm saying you want to get to that point. You want to strive to that point where you know the answer, where you can be the first point of call, so that a child growing up can obey this. Right? They can obey this and they can hear the instruction of thy father and thy mother because their father and their mother is giving them good godly counsel. Right? For they shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head and chains about thy neck. My son, keep thy father's commandment and forsake not the law of thy mother. Bind them continually upon thine heart and tie them about thy neck. When thou goest, it shall lead thee. When thou sleepest, it shall keep thee. And when thou awakest, it shall talk with thee. For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is light, and reproofs of instruction are the way of life. So you see here that there, is an ex there should be an expectation from children that they can go to their parents and learn the truth. And if they come to you and you don't know the truth, you need to step up in your Christian life. You need to step up as a Christian and learn the truth. Take on this responsibility. Make it personal and say, I am going to know God's word intimately so that when my children ask me questions, I have the answer. You know, I can give them good counsel. And you know, children, they can see lukewarm Christianity. You know what I'm saying? Like you, you may come to church and you can fool people at church thinking that you're a spiritual believer, but you know what? You're not going to fool your, your children at home. How many people do you know, you know, like all of us obviously, some of us may have grown up in Christian homes or homes with Christian background, and you see the lukewarmness of your parents' religion. You know, you know that, you know, maybe they're one person on Sunday and then they're different during the week. Children see that. Children know whether their parents are genuine in their faith or not, and it's going to require a genuine faith. It's going to require a genuine Christianity if you want to have that sort of impact on your children. Remember when we looked at Deuteronomy 6? Only a genuine Christianity talks about God as you're sitting, as you're walking by the way, as you lie down, as you rise up. See, a lukewarm Christianity that's just on for show on Sundays doesn't do that. But if we want to teach our children, if we really want our children to grow up in the ways of the Lord, you have to be a genuine Christian where you are actually seeking to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And that's where it comes now natural because you grow to that point where you're talking about God all the time. You're talking about God with your spouse. So it's only natural that you talk about God with your children because it's a part of your life. It's not just what you do on Sunday. It's who you are as a person. That's what you've got to grow to. You know, you don't have to necessarily feel bad if you haven't grown to that point yet, but that's what we're striving for, right? We're going on onto perfection. And even I am going forward. So I'm not talking like back at you guys. I'm saying for all of us. All of us have to strive for that. If we really want to impact the next generation, we got to be genuine in our faith, guys. You know, if we do not prioritize the things of God, we don't take the study of God's word seriously. We don't take soul winning seriously. How are we going to raise a generation to do greater works than us? To do even what we expect as a Christian. So we need to up the standard. We need to be an example to our children. And you know what? Children see us every day. We can't fool our kids. You know, they know. They, know, they see us every day. So we need to be genuine, not only when it comes to church, but even in our private life as well. So what example are you setting for your family? If you think about your Christianity. What example are you setting for the next generation? The way you talk. The way you dress. Ladies, the way you dress. The way you talk. What you do in your private time. What you do when your children are there watching. Do you think about these things? Do you think about how you present yourself? How you interact with people at church? you know, your level of zeal. What example are we setting to the next generation? Proverbs 22. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, the scariest thing about this passage for me is what I've underlined, that he will not depart from it. Because this is a double-edged sword, isn't it? 
You want to train up a child to prioritize church? Hey, when, when he grows up, the Bible says he won't depart from it. But guess what? If you train up a child to not prioritize church, to not have knowledge of the Bible, to not be zealous about soul winning, there's a real danger here, you know, but by God's grace, that they will not depart from it either. You know, they will take that example and it will be hard to get out of them. Philippians 4, look at what Paul says. I mean, would to God that we could say this about ourselves. Look at what Paul says to the Philippians. He says, those things which he have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do. That's the sort of standard we want to set where we are striving when we think about our own Christianity, our own Christian walk, our own spiritual walk, is can we say these words? Can we say, hey, the things that I've taught you, the things that I've passed down to you, the things that you've heard me say, the way I speak, the, the way I act, the way I dress, the way I present myself, can I say, hey, I want you to do as I do. That's what we want to be able to say to our kids. The things that you've learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. All right, so children should hear and see truth from their parents. So first, let's talk about Christmas. If we want to teach our children the truth, let's teach our children the truth about Christmas. Is your Christmas celebrations about Jesus Christ? If you celebrate Christmas as a Christian, you know, and you have your different, you know, some people think a Christmas tree is pagan. I personally don't think so. You know, I don't think Jeremiah 10 is talking about Christmas trees. I'm not going to preach about that today. But people have different traditions. I mean, giving gifts on Christmas is a tradition, right? That's based on, you know, the gift of God coming. It was Jesus Christ. You know, people decorate a tree and the things on the tree represent different things. You know, the gold tinsel or whatever, the, the star that led the, the wise men to Jesus. If you're going to, you know, celebrate by decorating a tree, just make sure it's centered around Jesus Christ. And it's centered around, you know, the lessons there as a family practice that it's about Jesus Christ, that it's not just about making a tree look nice. So with Christmas, like I said, there are things, there are things I like about Christmas, there are things I don't like about Christmas. Now what I like about Christmas is that it is a time where people stop and remember the birth of Jesus Christ. Remember that a saviour was born. Where it's a time where, you know, it's easy for Christians to be bold about being a Christian. It was funny at work that, uh, in my workplace, they are trying to take away the word Christmas from the holiday period. Because right? before it was always Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. But now what is it? Now it's Happy Holidays. <laughs> so what was funny that happened at my work was um, they posted a... Uh, like a, a, holiday, a holiday card for our customers and it just said happy holidays blah 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 and then a whole bunch of Christians just commented going like how is this not discrimination against Christians why are you taking away Christmas you know we're not in America you know in Australia it's Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year so just a bunch of people commented and then the company actually then released a Merry Christmas version <laughs> for those employees so Hey, I think, you know, always be respectful in how we dialogue at work and amongst colleagues. But, you know, when, when, when things like that happen, you know, don't be shy to voice your opinion, you know, because that, that's how, uh, how things change when we speak up. So is your Christmas celebrations about Christ? There are things I like, like I said, it's a time where people remember the birth of Jesus Christ. But there are things I don't like about Christmas. And what I don't like about Christmas is the materialism you know, people, you know, you know, I'm all for giving gifts, but what I don't like about gift giving is when people just buy gifts because of the occasion. Yep. Just like buying gifts for the sake of buying gifts. And you know why I don't like that practice? is because I, I feel it's a big waste of God's money. You know, just buying cards just because you have to give everyone a Christmas card because that's what everyone does. You know what I mean? And, you know, and like I said, it's a matter of the heart. So if somebody's got the right motive and they want to be a blessing to people, it's not that you're doing anything wrong, but any time that there is a special occasion, whether it's birthdays, anniversary, just buying gifts for the sake of buying gifts sometimes is, can be a big waste of money because sometimes you buy things that people don't need, buy things that they don't want you, know, you never want, you didn't want to give it to them anyway, but you just didn't want to come empty-handed. I just find that waste of money, that's what I don't like about 
think times like Christmas. And obviously the shops want you to buy all that stuff. The shops, this, this is probably why Christmas is still celebrated in Australia, because the commercial side of it, they still want to push, hey, you need to buy so many gifts, get your last minute gift, you know, all the offers start coming out to get you to spend money. To re, you know, because it's a holiday where people buy things, they want to keep that holiday alive because it's also commercially a commercial advantage as well. And the other thing I don't like about Christmas is Santa Claus. That's right, yeah. You know, at, at Roselands, there's a Santa Claus there. And, and you know what? I bet, I bet it's, not, it's not Muslims lining up to put their kid on Santa Claus. You know who it is? It's people that are supposedly professing Jesus Christ. That's right, yeah. You know, it's, it's Christ, people who profess to be Christians they're the ones celebrating Santa Claus, celebrating reindeer, buying the reindeer headband, you know, dressing their kids up as elves. What, what does that have to do with Christmas? I, mean, I don't know what Christian is thinking, you know, okay, I'm going to celebrate a Christian holiday. I'm going to, I'm going to celebrate Christmas and think about the Lord Jesus Christ. And then I'm going to celebrate it by celebrating Santa Claus and elves and reindeer and sing jingle bells and Rudolph the red-nosed reindeer what has that got to do with Jesus Christ right. nothing so why are Christians celebrating it why do Christians keep buying the merchandise to perpetuate Santa Claus reindeer and the elves it has nothing to do with Jesus that's why I never buy Easter bunny chocolates I never buy Easter eggs because if Easter is going to be about Jesus Christ I'm not going to spend God's money perpetuating a lie about Easter, perpetuating a lie about Christmas. I'm not going to, you know, when my kids see a Santa Claus, I'm going to tell them the truth, that it is a myth, so that they don't grow up thinking, oh, Santa Claus brings them presents. I mean, God forbid Christians tell their children that Santa Claus brought them presents. Don't lie to your children. Don't lie to them tell them the truth so that when you tell them like i said at the beginning when you tell them about the bible they expect to hear truth from their parents i want my kids to know that when i tell them something that's the truth and i'm not lying to them about other things so if you do celebrate christmas you got to celebrate it celebrate it to do with jesus you know if you're going to make it about the birth of jesus christ you know, that, that's all good and well. You know, I personally think, you know, I'm not like the Jehovah's Witnesses or some Baptists, right, where you can't have any celebrations. Birthdays are pagan. Thanksgiving's pagan. Christmas is pagan, you know. And I don't want to go into all that in this sermon, but just some of the ridiculous things they get said, like, you know, when they talk about the balls on the Christmas tree and they say, didn't you know that the circle is a pagan symbol? And it's just like, so the pagans own the circle now. They own the stuff. They, they own every shape and every number. Doesn't doesn't matter what shape or number it is. It's pagan or it's Freemasonry. You know, it's just it, it to me. You know, like the Bible says, let every man be persuaded in his own mind. You know, if you if you celebrate a holiday, that's that's up to you. But like I said, I think if you're gonna celebrate what you believe is a Christian holiday, Christmas, about the birth of Jesus Christ, make it about the birth of Jesus Christ. Don't make it about some lie and get your kids writing this list you know whether they've been naughty or nice just teaching them covetousness you know let's think about all the things i want that i don't have you know so we got to teach them the truth about christmas and if you're going to teach them the truth about christmas how well do you know the christmas story you know do you really know the christmas story and you know, i've preached about this before but you know when we talk about nativity scenes do you, really, do you really know, like when we talk about, we know the birth of Jesus Christ, I mean, do you really know what's true? Here's a couple of things I'll bring up, um, because there's some of you that may not have heard me preach about Christmas before. But here we see, we see here uh, in Matthew 2, sorry, it wasn't Matthew, uh, Matthew 1 is uh, when it was the conception. Matthew 2 is the, the wise men that come to visit Jesus Christ. Now, who's ever sung that song, We Three Kings of Orient Are? Now, did you know that that's not biblical? So when we start teaching our kids about the Christmas story and we start saying, oh, did you know that three kings came to visit Jesus? Are you teaching them the truth? No, you're just teaching them a song. You know, was there a drummer boy that came to visit Jesus? I don't know how the song goes. Does the, does the song go, the drummer boy came and 
playing, he's going to play his drum for Jesus. That's, that's just a song. That's not in the Bible. So if you think that there was a drummer boy in the stable and the kings are in the stable, you're mistaken. It says here, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. So what is a wise man? If you remember in the days of Daniel, Daniel was one of the wise men. Now was he a king? No, these were just the people that, you know, either, you know, were wise. They, they counseled the king on certain things like Daniel did, like Joseph did too. Daniel specifically and his friends were considered wise men. Wise men from the east of Jerusalem saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? Well, we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. Now, some people believe, uh, when I preached on Matthew 2 at the home, I just mentioned this. Some people believe that that star in the east is like a natural star in the, in the universe. And, and, you know, it would, maybe it was just a brighter star or maybe it was a comet on that day. And that's what led them. I personally don't believe that. I personally believe that the star was a supernatural star that, you know, I guess was kind of just seen and really bright and actually led them. And the reason why I believe that is because if the star was just a comet or it was like a, a natural body in the universe, how would they know which house to enter into? Because let's say you got to, you know, Bethlehem where Jesus was born because this star actually directed them to the house where Jesus was. But if it wasn't a supernatural star that actually hovered over the house somehow to tell them, oh, hey, this is the star that we were following. This is the house where Jesus is. How, how would they know which house to go to? Because they'd get to Bethlehem and it's like, well, this star is actually over all the houses. Anyway, that's just my thought. So my, my thought is, my opinion is it's, a, it's an actual supernatural star that led them because they knew which house Jesus would be in. Uh, Matthew 2, we go down a bit further in the chapter. It says, and when they had heard the king... They departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. Now, how many of you guys have seen a nativity scene where the wise men are present? Right? You see the nativity scene, you see Jesus wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. You see the shepherds with Mary and Joseph. But then you also see the, the wise men there offering the gifts. Now, is that a true picture of the nativity scene? No, because we can see here that when the wise men came from the east and they found Jesus in Bethlehem, the star stood over the house where he was. They came into a house and saw the child and presented him gold, uh, frankincense and myrrh. So this is what I'm talking about, is if you, if you want to teach your children the Christmas story, do you actually know the true Christmas story? So that when you go to a shop like Roseland's, like I will go to Roseland's and I'll see the nativity scene, I can I say to my kids, hey, were the wise men in the stable? No, they weren't there in the stable. Only the shepherds were there in the stable. <clears throat> Luke 2, we were just reading this before, and the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Saviour, which is Christ the Lord. Look at this. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Now this is a pretty important point because this was the sign to the shepherd saying, hey, he's wrapped in swaddling clothes and he's lying in a manger. But have you ever seen a nativity scene that's been built and Jesus is just like without swaddling clothes, just like lying in the manger? Have you seen that where he's just like out? Yeah. So I've seen where people make Christmas story videos and things like that as well and they don't have Jesus wrapped in swaddling clothes. And I'm just thinking, if you're going to make a Bible video, you're going to make a Bible story, I mean, how hard was it to read this and just see that that's how he was? I mean, it's, there are some things about Jesus' life that we don't know. We don't know all the facts and exactly what they wore, but at least the things that we do know, can you put it in there? You know, if you're going to make a cartoon about Jesus Christ in a manger, at least wrap him up in swaddling clothes like the angel said. These are the things that frustrate me about Christian media. Here as well is another one. This is my last one, just on, you know, the true Christmas story. But it says here, And it came to pass as the angels, if you remember, we read this, were gone away from them into heaven. So the angels weren't in the manger either. They weren't like these little babies with, with you know, wings on them and arrows, you know, just on top, of the, on top of the stable. You know, angels are men, 
Right? They came, they told the shepherds, then they went back to heaven, and then the shepherds came to see the baby. So the shepherds weren't, the, the angels weren't at the stable either. So if you're wondering what the nativity scene is in the stable, it's Joseph, Mary, Jesus wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger, and the shepherds coming to see that sight. But the wise men later, we don't know how many there were, so there wasn't only three, we don't know how many there was. But they came later when the child was older, living in the house with Joseph and his mother, and that's when the wise men came. So we need to know this stuff. This, and you learn this from reading the Word. Right? If you read the Bible, you study it out, and you start to see, oh, wow, those are the things I've learned just from pop culture, or those are the things I've learned from TV, or from, you know, uh, you know uh, badly enough, you know, our parents taught, maybe taught us the wrong thing. But we need, to, we need to put a stop to that as parents, get back to the Word, teach our children the truth. Where else should we teach our children the truth? We need to teach our children the truth when it comes to life. Right? So it's not just teaching the truth to our children about Christmas, but teaching our children the truth about life in general. One, I've got three things here. One is just about creation. Children will ask where things come from. You know, well, who made the world? You know, I remember Simon used to always ask every time he'd eat a vegetable. He's like, where did this vegetable come from? Where did that vegetable come from? So children ask all these questions. Do you know how to answer it? Do you have the truth in your heart? Do you understand why we believe creation? Why we're a young earth creation? Do you know how to debunk atheism? Those sorts of things you need to know so that you can teach your children that in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. So it's not just teaching your children the truth about Christmas today, just teaching your children about the truth of life in general, how life came about, but even issues in life. Now, one thing uh, I like to talk about as well is when it comes to, uh, you know, that, that word that nobody likes to say is sex. Right? When it comes to the bedroom, when it comes to the relationship between a man and a woman, a lot of people will say, hey, well, children shouldn't learn about these things. Children shouldn't be exposed to learning about, you know, the relationship between a man and a woman, um, you know, where babies come from. This is what I mean by teach your children the truth. Truth. Teach your children where babies come from. Don't lie to them about how babies... I don't know. I, I don't even know if there are still parents out there telling their babies that, you know, cranes bring their baby or whatever because they don't want to have that uncomfortable conversation about the birds and the bees. Just have that conversation. Just, tell, just explain to them. If you don't think it's a big deal, they're not going to think it's a big deal. I mean, I explain to my kids, like, this is how kids are made and this is where kids come from. This is how it works. And it's not that big a deal because that's just the reality of life. And if you think, oh, you know, kids shouldn't learn about the birds and the bees until they're 12, 13 or 14, how are you going to teach, this is why I'm going to Matthew 1, how are you going to teach them the Christmas story? Because guess what is included in the Christmas story? You know, a virgin conceives and bears a son. Why is that so, why is that so important? Because normally the way you make children is that a man lies with his wife and that children are born from that. So how are you going to explain to them, hey, what's so miraculous about a virgin bringing forth a child if they don't even know how children are normally made? Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not, till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and she called his name Jesus. So if we expect our children to read the Bible, we expect our children to learn about the birth of Jesus Christ, surely we would get to this story, and they're going to ask questions about it. The older they get, you know, I'm just saying, like, when they're curious, when they start asking about these things, just explain it to them. Don't lie to them, don't hide the truth from them, because we want our children to understand that they can come to us and get answers. They can come to us and learn the truth and we'll try and explain it to them in a way that makes sense to them. Now the Bible hits on some other uncomfortable topics as well. And these are verses that you probably would never hear preached about in another church. But these verses are in here. And the reason why I say this is because I'm not, I know in our church there's very young children now. But one day our children are going to be teenagers. You know, they're going to be 11, 12, 13, and from stories that I have heard, 
a lot of parents don't talk to their children about, like when I talk about life, I'm just talking about your body in general. Warning their daughters about fornication. Warning them about the dangers of fornication, the uncleanliness of fornication, the STDs that you can pick up from, uh, from, from fornication, the, 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 the fatherless children, the single mothers, warning them, even just teaching their daughters about getting their period. I don't know if you've ever met girls where they grow up and they, they, they get their menstrual cycle and they don't know what's going on. Well, where was their parent to teach them about that? Where was their mom to tell them, hey, this is what it means when you start growing up to be a man, you're growing up to be a lady, these are the changes you're going to experience and it's okay, it's normal. And if, and if you have any questions about it, you can speak to me about it. You know, but we would expect our children to read the Bible, right? They're going to come across passages like this. I'll just, show, just read some of these passages for you where it talks about the uncleanliness of some of the functions of the human body. Leviticus 15, verse 16 says, Is any man's seed of copulation go out from him? Then he shall wash all his flesh in water and be unclean until the even. So what do we learn from this? Obviously, we, you know, you might smirk a bit and say, oh, you know, obviously we know what it's talking about. But what's the point? The, the, the point of this is it shows this is why fornication is unclean. Having sex outside of marriage, having sex with multiple partners, you know, just, you know, prostituting yourself or guys just sleeping around. This is one of the problems. This is why God has marriage that a man and a wife, they're the ones that sleep together. It's confined and holy within marriage. But even within marriage, it's good to know that, hey, this act between a man and his wife is an unclean act. So you need to be wise about how you do it and what you do and all these sorts of things. And this is why fornication is such a terrible thing. But this is why we have to teach our kids. We have to warn our kids about these things because this is something the Bible talks about too. And every garment and every skin whereon is the seed of copulation shall be washed with water and be unclean until the even. So not only that on the man's side, but the woman's side as well. Look, the woman also, with whom man shall lie with seed of copulation, they shall both bathe themselves in water and be unclean until the even. And if a woman have an issue, and her issue in her flesh be blood. Now this is talking about a woman's period, right? Her menstrual cycle. She shall, be, she shall be put apart seven days, and whosoever toucheth her shall be unclean until the even. And everything that she lieth upon in her separation shall be unclean. Everything also that she sitteth upon shall be unclean. So we see here that you know, what come, the seed that comes from a man is unclean, but also a woman's blood is unclean as well. And these are things that we can teach our children to say, hey, this is why you ought not touch other people's blood touch blood on the floor, you know, you know, spread your blood to other people or, um, you know, even talk to our daughters and explain to them, hey, when you start becoming a woman, you're going to have a period. You're going to have blood come out of places and you need to be ready for that. You need to understand that. And if you have that sort of relationship with your children, then they're going to know that they can come to you for other things. Right? The last one I want to talk about is the Bible. You know, teaching your children the truth about the Bible. So first one was teaching your truth, teaching your children the truth about Christmas. Teach your children the truth about life, about bodily function, about where babies come from. You know, you may have to explain it in a way that they can understand. And I'm not saying you have to be necessarily crude about it, but just be honest with them and just tell them the truth. Teach them the truth. Teach them also discretion as well. So you teach them also what it is, but how they should treat it as well, so that they know why they should be discreet about talking about the bedroom, talking about you know, bodily functions and things like that. But the last thing I want to talk about is that you teach them the truth about the Bible. And first and foremost, you know, if we have a genuine Christianity where we want people to be saved, we want people to know the gospel, that's the first thing that we've got to try and teach our children. You know, any chance we get, we're trying to link things into salvation, right? Explain to them, hey, this is why we need a savior. Sometimes when they get spanked, you know, it's like, hey, you see how we're sinful. We get in trouble, we do things wrong. This is why you need a savior. But not only that, not only teaching them about salvation, but tell them about hell as well. I mean, hell is somewhere that 
we need to teach them about too. So we teach them about salvation. We teach them about hell. We don't want them growing up thinking that all God is is just a fuzzy bunny, right? And he's just love, love, love. No, God is love, but he's also hate. He's also wrath. So when we teach our children the truth about the Bible, we want them to have a balanced view of God so that they don't grow up saying things like, well, if there's a loving God, why is there all this suffering? See, the people that grow up and ask those questions is because they haven't been taught by their godly parents saying, hey, we live in a fallen world. God doesn't want us linked to this world, our hearts in this world. Some, a lot of suffering comes from man's doing or from, uh, from, from satanic influence as well. It's not all God. But if we teach them, hey, God's you know, sovereign, you know, they'll say he's, he's controlling everything, which I don't believe. I don't believe he controls everything. But let's say somebody teaches their children, hey, God controls everything and God is just love. And then they look at this world and they think, well, why is this world so messed up? It's because you haven't given them the right perspective on God. So we need to teach our children the truth about God, that he's not just a God of love. He's also a God of wrath. Look in Genesis 6. You don't have to get too far in your Bible reading to learn about the story of Noah. Right? I've got three examples here. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. So this is one example where people will teach their children about Noah's ark but if all you teach them about is that Noah built a big boat and he went and happily, you know, he's prancing around gathering up all the animals and it's all fun and fine and dandy and it just rained for a couple of days and Noah was safe inside the boat, that's not what the story is about. The story is about God's wrath. He wiped out the earth because of its wickedness and saved one family alive. You know, the size of the ark is another thing. This is something that Answers in Genesis always hearkens on, is having these children's stories where the ark is just so small and then you have the giraffe and the elephant's head popping out the top. This is not teaching our children the truth. If we want to teach our children the truth, we need to tell them. It was a really big boat. had plenty of space for all the kinds of the animals that were required. Another one where we lie to our children about is just Old Testament stories. Everybody knows the story of David and Goliath, right? This triumphant story about David, you know, but do we give them all the facts? Is it just when we watch a David and Goliath cartoon with our children that Goliath, you know, he just gets hit by the stone and then he's just falling down. He's like, oh, and he's got the birds going around his head. That's not how the story of David and Goliath goes. It says here, it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang it. Look at this. And smote the Philistine in his forehead. And the stone sunk into his forehead. Right? So this Philistine was killed by this stone. And he fell upon his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him Look at this, and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. So this is another story where we need to, tell, we need to teach our children the full story so that they see what actually happened in these Old Testament stories. The last one I want to show you here is just the, the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel with Elijah. So after Elijah has that face off with the prophets of Baal and he sets up the offering it says then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench and when all the people saw it they fell on their faces and they said the Lord he is the God the Lord he is the God and Elijah said unto them take the prophets of Baal look at this let none of them escape and they took them and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slew them there. So just three examples of stories that are always misrepresented to children. And why are we misrepresenting them? Why? Because 
I think it's because parents are trying to paint this rosy picture of God to their children, only painting him as a God of love and not a God of wrath as well. See, God also is angry with the wicked every day, and you wonder why children grow up and they don't believe that a loving God can create hell. And the reason why they grow up thinking that is because they don't think God is a God of hate. He's only a God of love. He's not a God of wrath. But this is what these stories teach us. These stories teach us that false prophets in this story, the enemies of God, which is what Goliath represents, the wickedness of man, God one day will judge. And that's why hell was created. And this is why everybody needs to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. And children will understand that if they understand the wrath of God, or why they need a savior. So you may think these stories are bad. You know, hopefully you don't. Hopefully you see these stories and the reason why God has put them in there. But if you read these stories and you think, well, they're not appropriate for children, let me tell you something. Hell is a lot worse. Yeah. Where the Bible talks about people being tormented. Look, and the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, look at this, the same shall drink of the wine of wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture. It's saying it's poured out, it's not diluted into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Now, if we're going to teach our children about a loving God, we've got to teach them, hey, this is what love means. Love means he's so full of love that he hates sin this much. And, and then children will grow up with a true picture of God. So we need to teach our children the truth. Teach your children the truth about Christmas. You know, we're going to be celebrating Christmas soon. Teach your children the truth about life. Don't censor things from them. Help them to grow and know what to expect as an adult. Teach your children the truth about the Bible. Don't think that there are parts of the Bible that are not suitable for children. We need to teach them the whole counsel of God. We're meant to love God, remember, with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and teach the words of God diligently unto our children. So if you're going to do that, it's got to start with you. The only way you're going to teach children the truth is if you have the truth in you. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for uh, your word. Thank you, Lord, that we have your word. I mean, we don't, we don't have to go fight for it. There's no persecution. We have it at our fingertips, Lord. We can search it, the scriptures daily just at the touch of a button. We don't have to sit by candlelight, you know, going through manuscript after manuscript. Lord, we can just search the scriptures at our fingertips whenever we want, 24-7. Thank you, Lord, for that privilege. And I just pray, Lord, as we consider that, to whom much is given, much shall be required. We have no excuse not to be able to teach our children the truth. We have the truth so accessible today. Help us, Lord. What we will have today, we have a lot of vain things in our life, a lot of pleasures and cares of this world, riches of this life that distract us, that choke us, Lord. I pray that you'd help our heart to be good ground so that we'll be the good ground hearer that brings forth fruit, some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. Help us, Lord. We need your grace. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.